second try. So um, I had one of the most extraordinary childhoods anybody could have. This is my father, Ulas Karanth. When I was a year old, he started taking me to parks across India. We would spend hours watching animals. And I did this for 17 years of my life. But the most exciting thing I think I got to do was when I was about 10 years old, in Nagarhole National Park, he collared several tigers and leopards. And I actually got to watch him do it. And I learned to radio track tigers. So this presents a very romantic, rosy, happy story of being a conservation biologist. But they were very dark times as a child as well. Um, before I get to that, people always joke saying, you know, you might have been Mowgli. And I do feel like I was Mowgli. Except in my case, Mowgli was this beautiful, um, um, uh, the tigress was actually this beautiful tigress called Sundari that we uh, collared and tracked for about six years in Nagarhole. But the, there were dark times too. Um, when I was, soon after he started collaring these tigers, um, there was a poacher who was nabbed in the park and in retaliation a mob came. They set fire to the park. They burned the building, they burned his vehicle and I'm pretty sure if he was around they would have killed him that day. So for the longest time, I seriously debated whether I wanted to be a conservation biologist because as a child, I saw the amazing side where you could sit there and watch animals for hours and learn so much about wild India. But on the other side, I saw how difficult it was going to be if I wanted to dedicate my life to this. I, I kind of stepped back for a while. Many years later, while I was doing my PhD at Duke, the question that struck my mind was what had happened to all of India's wildlife, particularly in the last 150 years. What we do know is that thanks to fantastic record keeping by the British, we have the most extensive records of natural history from anywhere in the world. And I realized that species like cheetah, which ranged from Africa into the Middle East all the way to Mysore, were wiped out by 1960. So my question was, what was happening to all the other large mammals that we knew of? So I dug into this database. This is a wild buffalo, a massive animal that was found from central to, nor uh, to the northeast. And you, uh, you can see how many people it took to bring this animal down. And what we do know of the wild buffalo is that it's critically endangered today. There's very few hundred of them left in the wild. So what I did was put together 30,000 records of hunting and naturalist history observations, looking at where people, um, largely the British uh, army officers as well as Indian royalty, looking at where they had seen or shot animals and then did the survey of um, current experts in India, asking them if they'd seen any of these species. And this wasn't limited just to tigers and elephants. Uh, I was able to compile this for over 100 species in India. What I found was dramatic and shocking. Tigers, probably the most iconic species that people associate with Indian wildlife today, were gone from 60% of India. The dark green shows you areas of places where they're more likely to be found and the shades are depicting uh, places where they're less likely to be found. So tigers today are, 40% of the world's tigers are found in India. We still remain the strongest hope for uh, saving wild tigers in the world. But this is not just about tigers. I was curious about what had happened to all the other species. So gaur, another fantastic animal. This is a thousand kilogram animal that tigers are able to bring down. Uh, once again, ranging all the way across India, now found in a few parks. And all of this range contraction happening in a period that started around the 1850s uh, and uh, up to the 1920s, really. And then black buck. What's unique about the black buck is that it's probably culturally one of the most tolerated mammals. If you go to Rajasthan and Gujarat, even today, you'll find herds of black buck, Nilgai, Chinkara, hanging around in people's fields, and nobody really harms the animals. And the research showed this as well. The, the, the animal's range had contracted, and large populations remain only in western India. So what do we, what do we need to do? Um, my research suggested a few things, that the parks are working. They're important for tigers, they're important for wild dogs, they're important for a lot of other species. What most people don't realize is just that 
India has only 4% of its land protected in 600 parks. And that doesn't seem like very much if you compare what India had as just wilderness about 100, 150 years ago, and you compare it to other parts of the world, including our na neighbor Bhutan, which has about 30% protected. If you look at this map, it's pretty um, depressing because it's not continuous areas either. They're fragmented, tiny, tiny parks that cover 300 square kilometers. So what are we gonna do about it? These parks hold an amazing diversity of species, several large mammals, uh, over 400 mammal species. They hold over 1,000, 1,500 bird species, and they hold the little guys as well, amphibians. I have a project going on in Karnataka right now where we're sampling coffee and rubber and adike plantations where we're looking at um, what, what, what kinds of uh, wildlife do these plantations support? And what we're doing is we're rediscovering frogs that have not been seen to science in 75 years. We're finding new species. You think all the species as a biologist have been discovered. That's not true. There's a lot of wildlife that's still unnamed and not found yet. But what I, um, what I also realize is that there's a lot of wildlife outside parks. This picture behind me shows elephants in a tea estate, and my research showed that as well. For elephants, for leopards, for a lot of wolves, there's a lot of animals that occur outside parks. So what are we going to do? They, they don't have you know, a lock and key telling them, stay inside the park, don't move outside. And this results in problems as well. So the pictures behind me show you leopards, sloth bear, and wild dogs, very commonly found um, outside parks in India. And when they're outside, there's problems. One of the biggest problems we have today is that of crop loss. 90% of conflict in India is related to losing um, crops to wildlife. And then sometimes there's retaliation against species as well. Similarly, about 5% is loss of livestock with retaliation against the main uh, culprits, which are leopards and tigers. So I, was, I started a research project in Karnataka about um, three years ago looking at what was happening in our state here. And what I found was that in a 10-year period, we had had about 120,000 incidents that the government had records for. What does this mean? They had spent about, about a half a million dollars compensating people. But in terms of was this representative of what was really going on, I wasn't so sure whether that was all the conflict that we actually knew about. So we did one thing. Last year, I took 65 volunteers with me. We went to five tiger reserves and visited about 2,000 villages in Karnataka, surveying people, asking them what, what issues they had with wildlife. And this was, um, the results were pretty shocking because we were trying to basically map high and low risk areas, the red showing you high risk areas around each of these parks, and what people uh, perceived was happening with wildlife. What struck me was dramatic. 70% of people don't even report conflict. So the 120,000 is not representative of the reality of the interactions between wildlife and um, people in India today. I've done similar work in Madhya Pradesh, in Rajasthan, and um, four other states, and the patterns seem to emerge. Reporting is very low. It's, it's you know, 50, 60, 70%. And in terms of what people felt, um, their, their biggest frustration was that even when they filed for compensation, it took the government a year to respond. It took the government, most, most often, they, um, unless it, human death or human injury was involved, the government didn't even respond to their situation. So we've done this now. We've scaled across India because Karnataka may not be representative about what's happening in India. We've scaled across parks because this, clearly my other work suggests that wildlife are not just in parks. There's a lot of wildlife um, outside. And one of the most neglected systems that most biologists, most scientists ignore are grassland systems. So we've been able to work in Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra and MP looking at what the interactions different. And the results are pretty much the same, that there is you know, 90% of people reporting crop loss, 5%, 5-10% reporting livestock loss, and very low levels of compensation. So in a country like ours, I think people always argue that um, why, why does India stand out? And I think what sets us apart is that even though we have 1.2 billion people, we have a hell of a lot of wildlife left. You look at China, you look at most other countries, 
and we've managed to succeed in holding on to most of this. I think the question now is what are we going to do going ahead? And how are we going to make sure that people don't retaliate against species? And one of the biggest frustrations I have is that those of us who sit in Bangalore or, or Bombay or Delhi, it, it's, it's sort of you're, you're sitting there preaching, oh, we need, we need the tigers, we need the elephants. We don't live with these big animals. You don't have 90% of your crops gone because six elephants came through. So I think we really need to sit and think hard about what kind of solutions are we going to come up with that are not just going to rely on the government. So one of the things we've we're planning to launch, actually, is integrating te technology with conservation. I've worked with a um, couple of my friends who own a robotics company. They've set up this web-based portal that will allow, um, that can be translated to any language. We've, uh, we're launching it in Karnataka and Canada first. But a villager can call into a toll-free number. This is used. SMS technology is now used to get all kinds of information very quickly. Farmers get weather information in one second. So we're going to try and use the same idea and get people to call in about conflict. We have existing field teams that work across all of these parks, and our people will respond. I don't want to replace the government. There is no way an NGO or an individual can pay out you know, millions of dollars in compensation, what we can do is try and make the process more efficient. We can try and make sure that all people are reporting conflict, as many people get compensation as possible, and this over time um, should lead to some level of accountability because you know when people report an incident and how long it took for them to get compensation. So this is in terms of um, solutions uh, that we're coming up with. But one of the biggest joys I've had in uh, field work has been, you know, when I did my master's and when I was younger, I would go out to the field with a couple of research assistants, do my work, come back. And I've realized to engage more people in science really matters. So over the last four years, I've taken almost a thousand people with me to several parks in India to do research. These have been 18 to 45 year olds. The, these have been doctors, stay-at-home moms, engineers, businessmen who've come and volunteered because they care for wildlife. We've made them work very hard. They thought it was a holiday. They came for a week or 10 days. They worked 14-hour days in you know, sweltering heat in Rajasthan or MP. But they've also walked away with a very different perception of what wildlife is. This romantic notion has gone, and I think they've, they're certainly more aware of the challenges that exist and the realities of what it's going to take to make sure people are safe and that we still have wildlife left in India. So um, finally, I think this is my argument for rewilding India. We're at an extraordinary point in our country's history where there's massive urbanization taking place. A lot of people want to live in cities. Farming in some places is becoming unviable. We have the resources, we have the money, we have the technology to come up with solutions that can matter. What we're trying to do, uh, which has been tried in some of other parts of India, is, uh, other parts of the world, is to build private land conservancies, build them in places where farmers can't really grow any crops because there are elephants on the land. These elephants are going to move through every year. There are no solutions. You cannot put up fences. I mean, it's just extremely risky for both people and wildlife. We also see opportunities where you can buy land, not just to mitigate conflict, but add on to the existing park system. The government is, is stuck at 4%. They're going to remain at 4%. And if you look at effective protection, you're talking about 1% of India set aside for wild India, which is about the size of Kutch. And to me, that's really not acceptable for all these fantastic species. And my research is, has also shown that plantations, whether they be rubber or coffee, are incredibly actually biologically rich. I, we may not find 400 species that you find in Badra or Nagarhole, but plantations also support 100, 200 different bird species. That was a real surprise to me. I thought with all the fertilizer use and all the management of land that you, know, you wouldn't find these extremely sensitive indicators remaining outside parks, and that's not true. So clearly, we have this landscape that's a mix of parks, but surrounded by um, intensive land use is still supporting wildlife. And so I feel that, you know, we clearly need to think 
long term. We need to think to stop defragmentation of nature. We need to think of rebuilding these corridors. I mean, most of you, I'm sure, pick up the newspapers today and see every, every day there's one page in every English Canada newspaper that talks about conflict. A leopard came here, an elephant did this. And increasingly, the media has also gotten into this habit of sensationalizing everything. What my research has shown is that there's incredible tolerance for wildlife in India left. When media sensationalizes it this way, there's a lot of lot more pushback, a lot more retaliation of people who so far have seemed to have coexisted pretty well with wildlife. I mean, I when I, we were doing surveys in Bandipur last year, I asked a woman, you know, wh why do you not even report Pigs are one of the biggest culprits in crop loss. And I asked her, why do, why do you not even report this? She said, you know, they've been around as, as long as we have. And as long as the pig doesn't really destroy all my crop, I'm OK with it. So clearly, India is special. India is unique. And I'm hoping in the next 20, 30 years, we're able to imagine bringing back wild India, bringing back species, so that my daughter, who studies in the school, She's seen her leopards and her wolves. She hasn't seen her first tiger yet. And I hope that you know she and her many, many generations of children will continue to see wildlife in India. Thank you.